Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest Dataversity webinar, Conform Dimensions of Data Quality, an Organized Approach to Data Quality Measurement. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the upper right-hand corner for that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Dan Myers. Dan is a Principal Educator of Data Quality Managers, or excuse me, Data Quality Matters, an e-learning company focused on providing information and data quality learning material. As an information quality practitioner, educator, and thought leader, Dan conducted a robust comparison of key IQ authors lists of dimensions of data quality and proposed a way to align the data management community by using common definitions. In 2016, he, he proposed a standard for set of dimensions based on his research called the, and called it the Conformed uh, Dimensions of Data Quality. Previously, Dan worked as an applications developer, data modeler, and manager of data governance and data quality. And with that, I will give the floor to Dan to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much. Um, really excited to be here. Uh, first time doing this, having done the conferences many times, but uh, never the webinar, so look forward to this. Here's the uh, agenda here, and I wanted to just cover some of the basics of the dimensions of data quality. I'm sure we have a broad range of different individuals attending today, so I'm trying to cover all of those different areas, starting out with some of the basics. And then, of course, if you're joining for uh, the statistics and a little bit of explanation around the the white paper that's uh, come out in the 27 annual report on the dimensions of data quality. Then, of course, we'll get to some of that at the end. Uh, and then if, if you have any uh, specific questions, we'll cover that in the Q&A session. So what are the dimensions of data quality? So probably my guess is most of the people on the call have heard of them before. So let's just uh, revisit that in order to make sure that we're on the same page. The definition that I typically use to communicate is that the conformed dimensions of data quality, so already jumping kind of to the conformed dimensions, but the dimensions of data quality in general also are categories used to characterize data and its fitness for use. Now I understand there's a little bit of nuance to that with some of the authors uh, also applying categories as uh, groups of dimensions, but for the layman, uh, the terminology category is often best used to describe the dimension of data quality. And the application, they can be applied in any industry to assess, measure, track, and communicate information and data quality. And the real goal of today is, is to uh, show you some information that should help your information quality initiatives uh, further communicate the quality of the data that, that uh, individual consumers of the data are expecting, as well as the producers of the data and the way that they present that. So here's a slide with just some of the um, definitions kind of thrown out there to give you a, a feel for what we're talking about today. So why do I need the dimensions of data quality? I mean, let's go back to the fundamentals of organizationally, is it something that I should spend my time focusing on? And that kind of depends on what role you're in, both in the business side and the IT side, having the dimensions of data quality offer a lot of different things. So let's go through a few of those. So the ACT is a quick reference a checklist and a guide to quality standards. So uh, when you're implementing projects, you can reference this checklist. Oh, did I cover X, Y, Z? Uh, is the data that I'm asking for out of this new system that I'm developing, is the way that I'm modeling it uh, going to represent the data in all of these dimensions of data quality? It kind of gives you a checklist. Too, uh, too often as humans, where we go through things fast and we just forget items. Um, you know, so I, I frequently travel um, at least once a month and I'm always, uh, you know, referring to different checklists that I've uh, developed in order to ensure that I have everything. Uh, and it's just a good practice uh, relative to uh, data management. So then also they can be used as a framework to se segment your data quality efforts. So it doesn't mean that you necessarily focus on one without review and use of all of the others. But uh, honestly, I'm, we, everyone can have their fair opinion on this, I believe, but I, I espouse using completeness as one of those fundamental dimensions that you start with 
because if you don't have the data there, then there's a lot of other things about the data that um, that are going to be uh, difficult to diagnose and work with. Now, I understand there's different situations for that. I'm sure that we'll have a lot of discussion around that later if we get into it. Uh, but that's just something to think about. How can you carve out your efforts and prioritize things using the the, frame, the, da the dimensions of data quality as a framework for your efforts? And enable people to communicate current and desired state of the data. So, I mean, you, you can basically look at this in context of things like Lee, Papino, Funk, and Wang. So these are um, initial authors that espoused uh, that some of the early dimensions of data quality. And in their, their book, Journey to Data Quality, they have the comparative approach, which basically allows you to take subjective uh, information, um, your survey of your uh, information consumers, and join that with the same kind of uh, data analysis that you would do in an objective way. So you may have some computer programs or profiling results that you profile and, and, and analyze your data in an objective way, but then also using those same dimensions to reflect and on uh, the survey results and, and joining those together so that you get both sides of the coin. And reuse of existing categories and definitions enables faster implementation times. So we'll talk about it a little bit more, but in, during the interview of uh, two of the individual of the respondents uh, that were that had responded to the survey and, and their their interviews are available in the white paper, uh, one of the gentlemen said, you know, hey, listen, the conform dimensions lays it all out for you, and it really prevents fistfights because at the end of the day, people can get pretty uh, pretty emotional about um, the way that you define different things, and uh, if that's going to prevent you from moving forward in a timely manner then why not use something out of the box um, that has a, a, a certain level of rigor to it? And we'll talk about that rigor a little bit later. And then matching the dimensions against a business need and prioritizing which assessments to complete first. So I, you know, I really appreciate this from uh, Danette McGilvery. Her book in 2008 you know, kind of lays out um, the dimensions of data quality according to, to her methodology. And she puts forward uh, in there the, the fact that you, know, you can look at how how you want to approach your project and or your program and looking at which dimensions of data quality, where your focus will be, uh, can determine different outcomes and it really helps you prioritize things with the business in terms of um, business goals and objectives that you want to achieve. And understanding what you will and, and will not get from assessing each dimension. Uh, if you're new to the dimensions or, or um, come from a background that isn't as heavy in data, um, then communicating your needs and what you expect to get out of each an enhancement on an existing legacy system or, or, or development uh, a sprint in an agile methodology, um, communicating with the dimensions of data quality facilitates uh, an environment of communication that is what we really need in order to ensure success. So where are they used? And we'll, we'll get into a lot more of the detail of that as we go through this in the next slide. But we use them to define you know, measures and scorecards, dashboards, and IQ International actually has a uh, seminar in about a week or two on developing dashboards. And you'll find a lot of the dimensions of data quality discussed within that. Uh, if you're uh, interested, I would check that out. And then also, you know, almost most importantly, at the end of the day, dimensions of data quality are just about communication. They're about naming. Uh, scenarios, de naming the way that we look at our data, the way that we want our data. And so the way that we have conversations um, can either be challenging if we're talking over each other, not, not understanding the meaning or being, getting confused because of the terminology. So if we have, as I propose, having a conformed set of dimensions, then conversation becomes easier. At least you, you don't need to necessarily agree on the way you define things, but at least if you understand how each other communicate those uh, and then reference those accordingly, then at least you're one step ahead. And there, you can also embed these uh, in the instructions or, or forms and, and other parts of your application. So uh, if you're explaining to non-technical, non-data oriented people how to do data entry, uh, it, you, you clarifying what you mean by completeness and or uh, integrity, uh, validity, these things like, like that can, can help um, facilitate uh, your data quality improvement efforts. And uh, also 
in terms of validity uh, on forms. Um, obviously, the, the sub, the underlying concepts, so the subconcepts that are espoused in the conform dimensions enable you to um, develop your requirements and design documents for IT in, in a more keep cohesive manner. Um, and then also, if you're in a data provision, in, a, in a, some sort of organization that sells data, provides data, um, or, and or within a business intelligence context, obviously, we all have a boss. Um, the boss uh, sometimes is our data consumer. And in that context, you have service level agreements oftentimes. Uh, so consider using the conform dimensions in order to better communicate and keep your definitions consistent throughout time. Uh, and then as we'll talk about in the next slide, you can really integrate the dimensions of data quality into the software development lifecycle. And so I'm going to switch over to that now. So if you think about it uh, from an ideation perspective, ideation being the first step that you do uh, within the project lifecycle. And uh, these names may be slightly different than yours, depending on um, how your project management team at your organization has defined the steps. Um, but generally, you have some step of ideation where the innovation starts uh, with the customer and the data. And most importantly, it's the knowledge of uh, your data and using the quality lens to ensure that success. And new ideas really uh, need data to be executed and to measure success. Uh, so I live here in Silicon Valley, and a lot of startups uh, are dependent on how well uh, they execute. And a lot of times, the focus can be on a functional perspective. But if you don't have the quality data, then no matter how good your UI is, uh, your data uh, that's driving that uh, can impact the functionality and can um, confuse customers and or drive them away. Uh, so there's a high need for data quality and the, and the measure of that. Uh, also, profiling data um, aligns uh, well using dimensions of data quality and allows you to understand the usefulness at, even at the ideation phase. So I don't know that most people kind of have gone through every phase and analyzed, OK, am I using data at this phase? And then am I using information quality, uh, principles, and uh, uh, methods of measurement at each of these phases? And one of the biggest things that um, the effective uh, implementation of new projects really requires a leap and balance of connecting data, different dispersed data with um, together in order to develop some sort of knowledge or some sort of product that uh, customers are, haven't had in the past. And you can only do that when you have uh, high information quality, when you have the quality that's uh, required in order to make that join or that connection. The next phase is conceptualization and initiation. And in this phase, uh, you know, it's about improving the customer service. So if it depends on if you're in, in, a, in a slightly slower uh, industry, say, for instance, insurance. And we're not, there's not a whole, whole lot of innovation. There are some innovative things that are coming online. But in terms of the actual product that you're providing, there isn't as much innovation. Rather, the customer service aspect is of, of critical importance. And how can you better serve that customer primarily comes down to uh, the way that you treat them and your customer service representatives, but the data that uh, you have about that customer and the transactions of that customer so that you treat them well, you treat them the way that they expect to be treated. Uh, and then innovative products, all, as I mentioned before, in conceptualization need to connect the dots. So understanding your quality up front, the beginning of the project is so, so important. And then Dimensions of Data Quality offers that to you. So requirements phase, right? So in the new application development, it's really eyes wide open about what data is available. If you don't know what data is available to you in your system, if you don't have that metadata, so having the metadata is actually part of representation and documentation uh, of your data, and, and it fits into the dimensions of data quality. Uh, maybe you haven't used it in that context before, or, or your organization hasn't adopted that to that context. But as you'll see, it's definitely within the conformed dimensions of data quality. <laughs> And a discussion about why you need that data and why uh, the, the design of the system needs to be done in a certain way in order to facilitate the collection of that data in that, in that manner, in that high level of quality. So the design level, of course, data models and the level of abstraction, is, it really uh, helps you accomplish things faster. But to the extent that you abstract things and build your models in a more abstract way, data quality and specifically metadata around those, those data quality 
requirements and integrity that either you build into the application or into the database itself are so important and, and that can't be really done well without the dimensions of data quality because it's really a communication framework for explaining your requirements. And also the strong focus on error handling um, uh, has uh, inevitably has benefits as well. So then the build phase uh, in sample data, uh, if sample data is available, the unit testing outcomes are improved. So one thing to, to point out here is, is that, you know, a lot of times developers uh, having developed data that is representative of the real world. So we have data security requirements that allow that the data uh, cannot necessarily be the production data in the development environment or even test environment. but uh, to the extent they use the dimensions of data quality to characterize the data in your production environment and then replicate something that's representative of that in your testing environments, even including your build phases for your test cases, can be extremely important. And to the extent that your developers, programmers, understand the and are able to communicate using the dimensions of data quality, your organization can be massively uh, more efficient than other organizations that, com that may ignore that completely. And in the test phase, um, similar to the build phase, for instance, test cases, uh, I know a lot of different developers, uh, test, testers who, in developing their test cases, rely heavily on metadata and existing data models and understanding of how the program should work, how the system should work, and, uh, and other discussions with the customers. To the extent that you understand the customer's needs better with the dimensions of data quality, you can understand how to better write, how to write better test cases. So it's really important that you understand these and then also uh, one way of really engaging business users is to make sure and use their data, their data with their own dimensions of data quality overlaid on them within the UAT process, a user acceptance testing process. And then of course, go live and support. So go live is focused on the customer and, and improvement in the prior steps uh, relative to the data quality but this means the faster response to the customers if you're able to understand customer issues in terms of uh, dimensions of data quality. So imagine if all of your issues were understood in terms of uh, data language in your, in your customer service division and that tickets were filed relative to the way that they heard the customer uh, say those things. And in other words, if they've already kind of translated the issue uh, using the dimensions of data quality. <coughs> So the question then kind of becomes, well, I, okay, you've got me sold on the dimensions of data quality, but which one do I use? Because I know there's a lot of them out there, and obviously um, the DM box um, is, is two, is out, and uh, has a lot more information on the uh, data quality, and uh, it's a good, it's a good uh, place to start. But let's look at some of the other things that are available to us in the field. So we can look at Wang and Strong, they're 1996, uh, paper and then obviously um, the others that contributed in 2002 and then Journal to Data Quality as I had cited for 2006. They're all very good beginnings. Uh, they're solid uh, but there is some confusion between timeliness and currency that I think um, is better uh, articulated in the conformed dimensions which I espouse. We'll get to that. Uh, and then Danette McGilvery's 2008 book I think has a very practical um, business focused uh, uh, approach to, to naming the dimensions of data quality. They aren't um, probably the most typical um, dimensions. She extends those for her methodology, and if you're using her methodology, then the use of those makes a lot of sense. And then you look at English, uh, Larry English 2009 or 1999, and Redmond uh, 1996, uh, have strong technical and logical basis. Um, Redmond has really, his discussion um, around views um, is really helpful to conceptualizing the dimensions of the data quality if you're, you're getting into it to a deeper level uh, and you want to uh, understand all the different ways that individuals have thought about it. I, I really like that one. I, I recommend a read of that if you, if you haven't uh, done so already. And then, of course, if you have manufacturing or, or other ISO um, connected applications or constraints, uh, perhaps you do business in Europe uh, re requiring some level of ISO um, 
the way that you communicate things in terms of ISO standards. So ISO has the um, 25, <coughs> sorry, 25012, uh, 2008, Dimensions of Data Quality. Uh, so I have a, a paper coming out soon in Information Quality Journal discussing the conform dimensions versus the ISO standard. Uh, I think that there are some strong documentation aspects to the ISO standard that are very helpful. Um, it does lack a, a level of hierarchy um, that is available in some of the other frameworks um, and overly is context sensitive, meaning that it relies on the individual customer to apply that dimension in a different way each time, which can kind of make it difficult to make it actually harder to standardize or harder to, to repeat the same thing in different situations. Um, and so that doesn't quite work for me either when I started looking at the landscape. Um, on the left-hand side here, there's a title of the um, uh, academic paper that Brian Blake uh, from Axiom and uh, PhD Canada at UALR and I have uh, just finished and will be uh, presenting that at the International uh, Conference on Information Quality in October in, in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. So if you're headed out there, consider uh, taking this uh, or attending the presentation that we have there. The title is on the evaluation of the conformed dimensions of data quality in application to an existing information quality privacy trust research framework, which is the work that he had previously done and kind of overlaying the work that I've done with the conformed dimensions and his work in the privacy trust research area. So about 2013, I, I, I sat down and started, um, as I was working on my IQCP, the Information Quality Certified Professional uh, credential, and reading all the different authors on this and, and trying to map it out in my notebook. And so I started kind of looking at this and started to diagram it out. And the way that I came up with doing that is to basically create a column here for every dimension, um, just like the single word dimension. Um, and then identify what, are the, is it, what is it that all the authors uh, refer to within that dimension. So making little bubbles down in the green section for each of the concepts. And then to the extent where it was mismatched, um, like for instance, let's take a look there at um, uh, definition of metadata. So definition and metadata oftentimes is cited as, as a, a dimension of data quality. Well, things that they included within that, that's the second to rightmost column, is clear, easy to understand definition. Does it include the measurement units? And does it include the values consistent with the definition? Um, and then it has complete and available metadata. But you know, one author might include the concept of complete and available metadata within the def within the dimension called metadata, or another one might say that complete and available metadata is an underlying concept within um, uh, presentation and identifiability, a different dimension. So at the end of the day, uh, there's a little bit less argument around what are the dimensions of data quality, meaning what are the names of uh, the dimensions in the top row there in the gray. Um, everyone can kind of get to maybe 6, 12, 15, you know, some sort of number of dimensions. But then the question becomes, well, what do you include within that? And that's really where my work has, has begun, is, is identifying all the underlying concepts that different authors um, have espoused, and then trying to reconcile that into some single version of the truth. And to the extent that we're able to, we try to say, well, how many authors think this belongs to validity? How many authors believe that this concept belongs into inaccuracy. And to the extent possible, with it's kind of a, a, a democratic approach. It's saying, well, there's four authors that believe it's an inside of accuracy. Let's keep it there. And there's only two that, that do otherwise. And so my paper, or the series of articles that I wrote in informationmanagement.com uh, titled The Value of Using the Dimensions of Data Quality, really stepped through that in terms of six authors combining or comparing all their different definitions and the underlying concepts and saying, hey, here's a way that we could get to some reasonable conformed, and I say conformed and kind of in the in the business intelligence way where we have a, a star schema and then we have uh, dimension tables on the outside and we try to reuse those uh, as, as if they're conformed and reuse those dimensional tables, then they have some standard and they're reusable because 
um, they can be used in different contexts or in different uh, to answer different business questions. So in the same kind of context, I said, well, hey, the dimensions of data quality need to be conformed. There's just too many things floating around out there. So that's why I proposed this name called the Conformed Dimensions of Data Quality. So then uh, in uh, 2015, I said, well, wait a second, you know, this makes sense to me. Why, how come nobody's picking up, or very few people are picking up on this? And um, so I, I said, well, you know, maybe there's a survey that I can put together to kind of understand how many people would be really interested in a standard and, and how would that work? And the reasons to agree upon the standard, what, what would be the reasons? What would be my elevator pitch for someone if I, if I saw them just for a short period of time? And really, to me, the, the primary thing is, is comes right down to communication. It provides language to communicate your data quality requirements. At the end of the day, it's all about how I'm talking to my coworkers about what I'm trying to achieve. Um, and recently, I saw this article around how naming is the hardest thing that you do. And you probably don't think naming is, is really, really important. But I mean, ever try to do it? So I had my son, my wife and I had our son uh, five years ago. He just had his fifth birthday. It was really hard uh, naming my son. I mean, there were so many really, really good names. Um, I mean, and then when you get to computer programming and, and uh, reusable code, you want names that a spouse uh, engender the kind of idea that you're able to conceptualize what that program does what that module of code does, um, what does that uh, entity, that table, what does that column uh, include, and how, do you, how, sh how should I use that? It all comes, comes down to naming and the definitions. So to me, the communication is the number one thing. And if we have many, many different uh, definitions for the dimensions of data quality, then inevitably we're going to not be communicating in an efficient manner. So efficiency also is, is the, one of the keys here real, relative to implementing things faster. Um, and, and as we now have an agile kind of methodology rather than waterfall, how fast can we, we do things? Now, we could say we're going to put the data out there in the sprint one, and then sprint two, we're going to start looking at the quality of it. You know, that's fine. You know, you're you're going to decide when you bring the quality lens to it. But once you do, wouldn't you want to be on the same page? Want, wouldn't you want to have the same definitions of that quality across your team. And with using the conform dimensions, that's what you achieve. Um, it discourages repetitive philosophical arguments. As I mentioned before, one of, one of the interviewees respondents of the survey that is interviewed and has a section in the white paper on it, you know, basically he says it just it eliminates the fist fights, you know. So everyone's going to have their take. Maybe you, you slightly disagree. Even you'll disagree with the standard. Um, but at least we can join at some point some focal point, some hub of understanding. And there's been a lot of uh, work by myself and, and now Brian and, and others um, to vet out uh, the conformed dimensions of data quality. And it, one thing also I might say is that it's a living standard. It's, it's an open standard available for free for other organizations to use. But myself and, and uh, continuously I steward it um, and others contribute over time is still alive. We're updating it and fixing it. We have release release versions um, available on the dimensionsdataquality.com. And uh, you know, there isn't any other um, set of dimensions data quality that I know of that is as comprehensive and alive, literally uh, improving as we move along um, like that. I mean, all of these other published works are static. They're finite. They, they do not move. And that just means that they're very, very good, maybe. but maybe not to the extent that we have within the conformed dimensions, and they won't ever improve because they're not moving, they're not alive. And having said that, the measurement, I mean, if it isn't measured, it can't really be managed. We always say that in data management, but having consistency between organizations uh, and it really enables uh, comparison. So you can benchmark within your organization, even when you have turnover uh, within an organization, if you stick to the standard, stick to the naming, and you know, make sure that it's in, uh, uh, communicated within your culture, that the conform dimensions of the way that you use it, then of course uh, you're going to be uh, ensuring a level of consistency that is desirable. Um, and then providing a framework uh, to define more detailed measurements and, and associated subconcepts. So a lot of people espouse dimensions data quality and they have some freeform paragraph about that dimension, but they don't really define it. That's one of the 
biggest challenges I found with trying to normalize all of the author's content was they often described them in a textbook, but they didn't really provide definitions that were concise, and they didn't articulate each of the subconcepts, which really kind of lead you to um, metrics or individual measures that you may uh, define within your organization to track that. And that's really where the rubber meets the road. And also, and lastly, the teaching, it provides a solid framework for teaching. I can't tell you within, uh, within the e-learning efforts that I've done within DQ Matters, having a real structure around what are we teaching and having that basis of the dimensions of data quality offers you a framework to begin and explain different concepts, especially individuals that are new to data or laymen uh, who know good data quality when they see it, but they don't exactly know how to explain it. And so offering them the dimensions of data quality with examples, uh, which is why in uh, this year, in 2017, I started the blog, the Conform Dimensions of Data Quality blog, on the website in order to just do that. We've uh, published about seven different articles over time, uh, which talk about each of the different uh, aspects of the uh, Conform Dimensions. So in our last survey here in 2017, uh, if the question was asked if an industry standard set of dimensions of data quality was available, how interested would you be in, in using that at your organization? And it was pretty revealing that, you know, again, most people do indeed uh, want to have some standardization. So fi over 50% are very interested. And these levels have stayed relatively uh, consistent over time, as well as then you know, somewhat interested, uh, another 30%. So right there you have uh, around 80% of individuals saying, you know, yes, we really want some sort of a standard. Okay, so really quick dive into the website, uh, dimensionsofdataquality.com. Where do you find things? I just wanted to throw this out there, the standard, conform standard menu on the top left. If you uh, look underneath there, you see about the standard, it tells you more about uh, the effort that's gone, that we've done so far. List of the conform dimensions, and that really is at the summary level, meaning what you would see in a textbook and definitions for each of those dimensions. And then the detail level is really at the underlying concept level, which is, is that each of those smaller uh, components that goes into that dimension. And the blog, of course, is under the news and blog menu item. And then you can see, uh, actually, the screenshot itself is from the blog page. And the blog archive lists those by each of the months. I usually I do one, maybe two a month, but um, that's uh, the nature of it so far. And so then uh, Shannon has the white paper that she'll be distributing after the webinar for those attendees. Um, you, uh, it's been developed or completed for 2015, 2016, and 2017. So the prior years, uh, you can get those from the website. So let's take a look then at the actual survey results. So how was the survey conducted? It was a web-based survey over a one month period of time. So each of the years it's been conducted typically in the month of April to coincide with Enterprise Data World. And oftentimes I present, or actually only one time of the three so far, I've presented uh, on this topic at, uh, at uh, Dataversity, um, Enterprise Data World. And it turned out really well, a lot, get a lot of uh, individuals participating in the survey that way. Uh, it was also advertised on LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, the Conform Dimensions website, and through referral and prior year sign up. So in, in last year, in 2016, we started collecting individuals' um, names and email addresses in order to offer them the ability to answer the survey year over year so that we can start tracking some of the changes within their organization, if there are any, and also um, ensure a stronger repeatability of the survey year after year in order to um, to save uh, time and effort and marketing to people to try to get them to take the survey. So I, I think when you read through the white paper, you'll see a lot of valuable information. And uh, it just, um, it's just amazing how many different things you can pull out of the survey with the data and the questions that we ask. And so I really highly uh, encourage you to take the survey next year. Uh, there's links inside of the survey, inside of the white paper itself, to sign up uh, to be reminded about the survey next year. 
So please join that, opt in to, to get that survey next year. Um, now, I do have to say that there is, you know, if, as we go through the survey results, there's some response bias, we say, um, given that so the response bias would be that the people that are responding to the survey behave in some way different or uh, more or less than general individuals uh, or general organizations in, in the broader context. So my assumption is that there is some level of this. We haven't quantified this specifically, but to the extent that you're aware of the dimension of the data quality concept and maybe even believe that there's some value in it, you're more likely to take the survey. So when the survey says that X number of organizations use the dimension of data quality, it's more than likely that the people that are taking the survey have used them in the past and know their value, and therefore they're going to be answering that they use them. So the numbers, you might expect them to be biased a little bit high in terms of you know, their association and comfortability uh, using the dimensions, and therefore the answers biased a little bit in that way. Now, how could we resolve that in the future? Obviously, collecting more data would be the number one uh, a way to do that. Collecting more data across a broader uh, landscape of individuals in business and IT that use data. So data scientists, uh, maybe not necessarily the ones that are collecting the data through IT systems, but rather data scientists on the consumer end that they, do they understand the dimensions of data quality and and use those to communicate to IT departments and or business customers about the, the levels of quality that they need and then could even be answering the survey. So the goal is really to um, uh, gain more respondents in order to, to eliminate some of the response bias that exists. So diving into some of the results and uh, how often, so one of the questions that we asked was, how often does your organization classify data related defects using the dimension of the data quality? Um, and so the percentage of respondents for the, the 2017 was on an ongoing basis, they said 40% of them. So, I mean, again, given that bias, say that the number is a little bit inflated because the people that are answering um, already do this. So that's why they were attracted to the title of, of the survey. Um, but wow, 40%, that's pretty good. Um, but then again, on the other hand, why is it that 8% only used it once, 29% have considered it but haven't used it, and 15% have never, to their knowledge, used it, and then 8% really didn't even know about it, or they're totally unsure whether or not it was used in their organization. So if our goal is to maximize information quality within the community, um, then we should look at this and say, hey, wait, if dimension of data quality is valuable, yes, we think they're valuable. Whether or not we use the conformed dimensions, let's just say dimensions in general, but the dimensions of data quality are valuable, why wouldn't the pie chart say 100%? So everyone's not using them, something, something's going wrong here. So my, my guess is that everyone's describing and communicating data quality issues. They just aren't using what they consider to be the dimensions of data quality. They haven't uh, uncovered the resource, resources that are available to them. You know, you could do even better to use a, a standard like the conform dimensions of data quality. But this is just kind of the survey's take on uh, the, the survey communicating what level of improvement we still have to go. So we have a long ways to go, 60% of this. I mean, eventually we would hope that 100% of organizations are, are using the dimensions of data quality in, in some way. So does your organization have a method of categorizing data quality issues? using the characteristics of the data and its fitness for use, like the dimensions of data quality. So, you know, how do they, how do they frame this within their organizations and how well governed is it? Um, the question then becomes, uh, you know, yes, there's one, and, and it's quite actually amazing that, you know, in, in many organizations, nearly 30% of the respondents, so the, you know, again, the, the question is, can you extrapolate on this and say that within the industry as a whole, 30% of companies are using dimensions of data quality, and there's only one like standard within their company, right? So it, it can be done in a smaller organization, really hard to do in a larger organization, but is it really 30%? So probably not, I mean, given the survey bias a little bit with the, the response bias, but wow, um, there are in, uh, companies that are doing this, and they have better communication among themselves because they're doing this. So if your organization isn't doing it, then you really want to do that to step up. 
Uh, and then yes, there's one, but it isn't well defined. 30% again, right? And then 20%, there's various methods, various methods across the landscape. And if that's where you have to start, that's fine. It is hard, as you know, in data governance to change anything once you've started it. So if you're thinking of picking it up from scratch, maybe consider the conform dimensions. Or if you're going to use something else, at, you know, at least use it consistently. So drum roll, which one is the most used? Well, <laughs> probably kind of figure that out. And it's pretty logical that most people, at the end of the day, probably due to some of the confusion around what aspects fit within accuracy, they listed accuracy as the most important or the most used. Um, and this has bounced around a little bit over the years uh, of doing the survey. But we see accuracy right up at the top and typically completeness in the top two or three in terms of uh, usage. It's a lot of fun to kind of look at this for the first time. But if you're like me and you've seen it a lot of times, it kind of kind of gets old after a while. The question kind of becomes, well, how have these jumped or changed over time? And is, the, is it really representative? Is my sample size with the survey at 48 respondents, is that really large enough to say, yeah, there's something going on when something jumps? So I like to do this. I mean, you need to be careful with inferring too much uh, around this. And uh, some of the summary here on the left-hand side posits some of my, my theories on that. I'd be really interested to hear from you guys as well. So um, you know, shoot me an email uh, and give me your theory on this uh, later on if you have time. But accuracy was reported to be the, the most used dimension in 2015 and back now in 2017. It wasn't in 2016, as you see there. Um, it you know, really confirms our earlier observation that these two dimensions are really at the heart of most organizations' data quality efforts between completeness and accuracy. And accessibility jumped all the way from 10th to 7th. And we, we don't obviously have total uh, uh, picture. We don't have the full picture of this. But I, I kind of loosely associate this with a larger focus on data lakes and having more data available in, in one place. It seems that the big focus right now is around big data, um, data mining, uh, uh, sorry, uh, um, algorithm design, um, AI, deep learning, um, and so forth. That often requires access to a lot of data, in not only in volume, but in, in veracity and, and uh, variety. Uh, so these different sort of uh, dimensions of big data, as we call them, um, and where accessibility is really the key to understanding that. So that's my take on why 2017 has such a jump in accessibility, but I'm, I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say about that. And consistency climbs back uh, to the third position from the fifth position. In a lot of what I do um, for clients and on and, a and day-to-day basis is, setting up controls that balance between different systems, uh, whether it be from a more accounting perspective and a top to bottom, um, or a cross-system balancing where you're uh, ensuring that uh, the data from two different systems reconciles and so forth. Uh, that's really fundamental to uh, the consistency dimension. Uh, so the, yeah, that's interesting. There's a comment here on, on security and the dimensions of data quality. Um, a lot of times, uh, so the way where I put security is not in it as its own dimension based on uh, my research, rather as part of accessibility, the security components come into that. And uh, we discussed that a little bit in this paper, but um, uh, the actual, the, the white paper with Brian Blake that's going to be coming out in ICIQ has a lot more of that discussion. So shoot me an email if you want to discuss that more offline. And then 10C, uh, please choose in which industry or organization is categorized. One of the kind of the problems or concerns that I had uh, and is brought out in the white paper is such a lack of use of the dimensions of data quality in certain industries. So not only do we need to get 60% more organizations using the dimensions, but specifically certain tiers are just not represented at all in the survey. And again, that could be due to response size. But what I did is I said, well, rather than tell you all the different um, industries that were in the survey, which you see there on the right-hand side, it's just too many pie pieces. So I said, well, let's do this. Tier one includes the finance, banking, and accounting. And I split those out in case you're in one of those, one of those categories. 
and you want to understand how your peers are doing relative to yourself, uh, 21%, 10%, and 11% all make up tier one. So these are the guys that use them and, and they're pretty using them pretty decently. And it's a highly competitive market environment um, uh, and, and very much a for-profit environment. And then the tier two is industries that only make up 6% of the response uh, of the responses in the survey. And that tier two is the government, state government, retail, manufacturing, software development. You can see those those actual industries listed out by tier below. So if you're in one of those industries and you're willing to talk to me about it, I'd really like to understand why, why what are the things that are inhibiting your organization from implementing the dimensions of data quality at your organization? And it might be part of a broader, like, you know, data quality or, or data management as a, as, a, as a domain that in total is hard to get buy-in from uh, our, our leaders in the education uh, industry. You know, whatever that is, you know, that would be interesting for me to understand and be able to include that in the report next year. And then handle that bias in the survey by soliciting, soliciting more responses from um, organizations in those industries so that we have a better representative uh, sample. So with that, I'm done and want to leave time for questions. It's my professional profile. Um, follow me on Twitter and, and LinkedIn. Uh, you know, connect with me so that uh, you can get the latest and greatest. I'm usually present two or three times a year um, at various conferences and uh, have other professional um, events and what forth that I participate in. So I'd love to get connected. And uh, Shannon, I'll turn it back over to you to uh, facilitate some of answering some of these questions. Dan, thank you so much for this great presentation. Um, and just to answer some of the most popular questions that come in, I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Thursday to all registrants with links to the slides, links to the recording, and anything else requested. And one of the first things requested is um, where can uh, where can we find your blog? So if you send me that link as well, Dan, I'll make sure and get that in the follow-up email for this for sure. our attendees here. Um, so. How many, uh, regarding the survey, how many incomplete survey take, was there? How many incomplete? Um, incomplete. So the, the problem yeah. with the web surveys is that there will be like thousands of people that want to know what the survey is, and so they'll come in, maybe not thousands, but there will be a lot of people that click through to just get the introduction to the survey and then drop it having not taken anything. Most people are that way. There are very few that actually started it and, and didn't finish it. Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head how many of, of those were, but there were some that had to be disregarded. For the general rule, I, th I think there were like maybe two responses that, uh, that were not completely finished. It was like the last two questions. So I was able to, to salvage those two, but it's a very minor number. Sure, that makes sense. I've certainly experienced that with ours. Uh, so, you know, how is <laughs> accuracy measured? How is accuracy measured? Mm -hmm. uh, so, for that, why don't I go to the end of the presentation and I threw in the, dimen the conform dimensions. And at the dimension level, accuracy measures the degree to which data factually represents it's associated real world object, event, concept, or alternatively matches uh, the agreed upon sources. So this is the definition at the dimension level. And then you have things called underlying concepts called agree with real world and match to agreed source. There's only two underlying uh, things within that. And then if you go to the next slide, you get a little bit better picture when you look at the underlying concepts, the definitions. So all of this is included in the presentation for reference, but please don't necessarily use this. Use the website because that's where we keep everything up to date. Um, and uh, accuracy, so you see the two sub-concepts, agree with a real world, which says degree that data factually represents its associated real world object, event, or concept. Uh, that's the most used um, definition. Um, but of course, a lot of times when there are things where, say, I buy something on Amazon and there's an event tracked, um, that event is the system of record for that. I can't go back in time to, to review that event 
the, the only mechanism that exists to record that event is within the Amazon's um, operational systems. And so that's matched to agreed source, which is a measure of agreement between the data and the source of that data. This is used when the data represent intangible objects or transactions that can't be observed visually. So, um, you know, while you're there, too, I mean, the question came in, you know, what is the difference between timeless, uh, timeliness and currency? So you've, you've definitely displayed it in the, last, uh, the previous slide and this slide. Anything you want to add to that? So I think that's where Wang and Strong and their original work um, in the dimensions of data quality had um, a little bit of confusion, and I think the conform dimensions clears up. Um, to me, the way that it works, and, and based on you know most of the authors that I read, it, a clean way to separate that is that timeliness is that the expectation of when it gets to me, and how how well do I um, have access? It's more of an availability issue. Is, that, is it available in the time manner that I need to get it? Versus currency is you know how how well that reflects the, the real world. So even though I get a report daily. Um, that information, even though I get that information daily, it might have been recorded weeks before. So maybe I have a biologist collecting data in Russia, and they have to, uh, you know, ship it on some, uh, sh literally on a ship or some boat, or there needs to be some analysis done to it. Um, so the data is no longer current, and that currency really measures how it is to the real world. Timeliness is how, how quickly I get that information. It's confusing. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, another t good topic that we've got going on here, too, with that um, uh, is, you know, what are your thoughts on security as a dimension of data quality? I've seen it here and there on lists, but not often. However, security is often core to determining if data is fit for purpose. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's really where I, so here's the problem within uh, information quality. We have this domain called information quality and we, we try not to look too far abreast in other things like info, InfoSec communities and how they define things. And that's why working with Brian on that paper that's coming out um, in October has been really fun because he, he's taking kind of a different approach to it and he's able to find the, the controls and descriptions of the things that he, the way he looks at it from that InfoSec perspective under access control because security is really um, measuring what level of access someone has to that information. Um, and, you know, obviously this probably can be expanded a little bit more in terms of refine. The question is how many tiers do you want in the conformed dimensions? Do you want to have like a dimension level, an underlying concept level, and then a sub concept level uh, of, of detail? And uh, so I, the real goal of the conformed dimensions is that we keep it as simple as absolutely possible, but not ruin um, the veracity and, and, and the real conceptual strength of it at the same time. So, but I'm, I'm completely open to exploring ways to enhance this, especially if there's enough academic rigor to support, you know, adding another con underlying concept or articulating the existing concept in a, in a better way. Um, I also have a paper coming out in, in IQ International um, that discusses the, the ISO dimensions of data quality compared to the conformed dimensions of data quality. And there are some security slash system specific um, ramifications there. So um, if you're interested, uh, subscribe to the blog. I, my, my best solution, my best recommendation is everyone should sub subscribe to the blog so that when I publish these papers, you'll, you'll get them and, and or you'll get the summary in the blog so that uh, you can stay up to, up to date. Awesome, love it. So are there differences in dimensions for unstructured versus structured, and any suggestions on standards for metadata for unstructured data? Yeah, um, so actually, um, Bettini and Scanacopito, uh, I'm not saying that second author's name very well, but Bettini, B-A-T-I-N-I, -I, um, is, uh, so look at, look at their book, um, it says Carlo. Carlo Bettini, uh, 2016. So their 2016 book has a decent um, coverage of the uh, dimensions of data quality with res respect to unstructured data like maps and uh, web documents. Um, my goal is to stabilize the conformed dimensions on mostly relational um, 
constructs first and then move into those areas. Um, my wife works on geographic information systems and I come from that a little bit of that background as well. So I, I'm really, I'm already salivating over uh, spatial data quality concepts that I want to get in, included eventually. But um, there's only so many hours in a day, especially when you have kids. <laughs> <laughs> True. So, uh, could you comment on the dimensions in relation to the information steward application? Information steward application? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand the, the context of that and the meaning. Um, so, maybe we can get a clarification from the questioner. So, um, while we wait for that, um, let me move on to the next one because I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, do you apply data quality dimensions by report or at the source? Both. So, uh, so I think the question will be on the report, and and really uh, Olga uh, Medanchik, um, who's presenting, uh, who's her, uh, as far as I understand, her husband also wrote the book um, Medanchik in uh, 20, uh, 2007, I think it was, on uh, uh, data quality assessment. Is is uh, both of them are really great at data quality, and uh, and uh, so I encourage you to attend her uh, IQ International webinar in about a week and a half. Um, but where do you apply them? She's going to talk about um, dashboards and and reporting uh, through dimensions of data quality. The problem with dimensions of data quality only in a report is the business sometimes doesn't understand them to the extent that you use them in your report. The, who is your report audience? They need to understand what they're reading. So if you need to um, define those in the context of your customer, then that's more appropriate. Um, having said that, there will always be somebody in the organization that needs to be looking at it from a conceptual dimensions of data quality level, uh, which a set of standards, a set, set of standard reports along those is really important. So another kind of exciting thing that I can't promise anything on, but I'm, I'm starting to work with some vendors to see how they can include the conform dimensions in their tools so that as we're comparing data quality tools such as a data profiler, we, we have more apples to apples comparison of each of the vendors and each of their vendors functionality. Um, can they perform XYZ underlying concept of the dimensions of data quality um, and, and so forth and so on. And I've had actually a generally positive response. So if you're a vendor on the phone, you know, you know let me know if that's interest to you. I'd love to explore some of those options. Love it. Lots of questions coming in. Um, so uh, where can I find definitions for the data quality dimensions listed on slide 15? And if you maybe, again, send that to me, I can get that out to, in the follow-up. Yeah, 15. Well, so yeah, and so the survey is all based on the conform dimensions of data quality. So in the white paper, in the appendix, it lists out all of those dimensions of data quality and the definitions that were used in the survey. But that's stagnant. It's it's fixed. It's finite, um, and and it, it it isn't up to date. So you want to use the dimensions of data quality uh, website. So right here, that QR code. If you just scan the screen, scan that QR code, uh, or go to the the site dimensionsofdataquality.com. Um, then that's where the definitions are. That's what this page is, is explaining where to go to get those definitions. I love it. I think that's the first time we've had a QR code presented. That's awesome. <laughs> well, usually uh, the paper base is better, but I, I figure somebody's going to scan their screen, so <laughs> might as well. Um, just one question. Uh, in your inquiry asked about a unique data quality index, how can we build one with all dimension nor dimensions normalized? Um, I think I would need to unpack that. There's a lot of things in that that uh, I need to understand what the person asking is, what's the context of asking it. Um, I mean, you could do, so I have actually some clients that are implementing the conform dimensions in their organization, and um, they are developing this survey at their organization just for them to kind of do that baseline. And, and uh, yeah, I think that's what they mean when they say index is basically develop using reusing this survey. And uh, I don't mind at all giving out the language to this survey for other people to implement within their organizations. There's nothing proprietary about uh, 
uh, asking the using the language of, of the conform dimension. So um, just ping me and I'll, I'll help you get what you need. Well, Dan, that does bring us right to the top of the hour. Thank you so much for this great presentation and education, and thanks to our attendees and community for being so engaged in everything we do and all these great questions that have come in throughout. Again, just a reminder, I'll send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday to all registrants with links to the slides, the recording, and all the additional things that have been requested throughout uh, the Q&A here. So I hope everyone has a day, good day, and Dan, th again, thank you so much for this presentation. We just really love it. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Have a good day. You too.